times. And recently, and it's about to go, Abraham and Sarah and Lot, you know, in uh, Genesis 18 and 19, it talks about, you know, we think about Lot trying to make a uh, case of Lord to not destroy Sodom and Lord, but it's not Lot, it's Abraham. And Abraham is, uh, is there and, and Lord didn't, didn't hide from him what was going to happen because he knew that, uh, that he was a just man and he knew that uh, whenever Solomon and Gomorrah was going to be destroyed. And so he, he tells Abraham, he tells him what's going to go on, but he sent two angels to talk to him and give him the word and stuff. And as he was there, and, and Sarah, he actually told him that uh, she was going to conceive a child and, you know, it was going to be Isaac. And she, was, she was there and she overheard him and, and she laughed. She, you know, in her heart, she laughed at him. And uh, they called her out on it and said, you, you laughed, and she denied it. She lied to the angel. She lied to the Lord. You know, said, I didn't, I didn't laugh. And he said, yeah, you did. You know, and, and that's the way it is in their lives. You know, we may be able to hide something from one another, but Jesus Christ sees it all. We may be able to lie to one another, maybe tell them doing this or doing that or not this or whatever. You may lie to, to your friends and family or whatever it is. Christ knows it. He already sees it from the heart. So you can't hide it from the Lord. So you might as well be honest with him, especially, but he already knows the truth anyway. So Abraham is there, right? With, for Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's there trying to talk to the Lord. He said, Lord, you know, the Lord tells him, if you're trying to speak to righteous men, he said, I will take and not destroy the city. I will let the city stand and not destroy the, the righteous with the ungodly. And, and Abraham was talking to him and said, Well, said, you know, can I be blessed five? Can we do 45? If we see 45, if we find 45 good men, though, can we not, not destroy the city? And the Lord said, Yeah, and he keeps going and keeps going. And he gets one down to 10. They couldn't find 10 good men in the whole city. And they're there, and the Lord's getting ready to destroy this place. And what does he do? The angels come in, and Abraham and, and, and Lot is there. And whenever we look at it, whenever the, the angels come and they're talking to Lot, he doesn't understand them. Sometimes we entertain angels and don't even understand them, don't even know that. So we need to be on be ready and prepared. Whenever somebody comes up to us, they're telling us about the Lord and Savior. Even though we're saved, we need to understand what the Lord is doing in our heart. Maybe the Lord put something up on their heart to tell us because of something that's coming to pass. As we look at our lives, we understand that the Lord put something on our heart. He sent angels in our past and told us, oh, you need to be saved, you need to go to church, you need Jesus Christ in your life. We don't think about that until you get saved. You say, well, somebody give me that word. Somebody planted that seed. Somebody give me just a little bit of water to make it grow. But the Lord said, I will give the increase. He'll give the increase of the Spirit to let us know that what's in our lives, that we need Jesus Christ and nothing besides Him is going to make us whole except through by the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lot is there, right? He was there. And whenever he's there, the angel's coming to him. And he, they said, well, we'll just stay outside. And Lot said, no, come on in. We'll bring you into the, into the house. They said, no, we'll stay outside. We'll dwell in the, in the streets there tonight. But Lot begs to him and tells him, come on in. And while he's there, what comes up? The, 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 the people of the city, the men and the children, the young people, they start coming in. And they start what? They start pressing upon the door. They start wanting to take and get the two angels out. And we look at it. Is that not what the world wants us to do today? You can be settled in your house and everything be good. And we're not talking about the house at home. We're talking about in God's house. But once you step outside of God's house, doesn't the world want to devour you? Doesn't the world want to take and devour you? Say, come and be with us. You can be separated. You can be with the Lord, but you can also dwell and be with us. But there's not. There's only one way to heaven. That's done by Jesus Christ. And we need to take and make sure we're settled in our hearts. We know what the Lord has got in store for us. We may not know what tomorrow brings, but we honestly know what tomorrow will bring if we pass on from life into death. We say, well, we're going to die one day, and that's exactly right. But wouldn't it be a great thing, honestly, think about it. We celebrate the 25th of December being Jesus Christ's birthday. We celebrate that day, and I don't know exactly when it is, but that's the day we've set aside. But just think about dying on the 25th of December. We think it's sad, but if you're a Christian, that's just the beginning. We die and go on to be with our Lord and Savior on His birthday. Just think about that. Whenever we get to be with Jesus Christ, we taste a little bit of it whenever we get saved. But thank God that whenever He is there taking a knocking on our heart's door, that unction is there, that little bit of faith we step out on. But knowing that we get to live with Jesus Christ forevermore, no matter what kind of in our lives, as long as we hold on to that hand, we can be saved. He said, because I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Come unto me and you suffer, man, I will suffer you. Knowing that we know we've got life because He put it upon our heart. He did it from the beginning of time. This book of Genesis was in the beginning. We talk about whatever the Lord made the earth and the heavens and everything. He put all of them upon the ground and put them all upon the earth. That was in the beginning. That was before anything we think about, right? Moses wrote that book. So how was Moses writing the book that was before he ever happened? Because the Lord instilled it upon him. The Lord led him and guided him and gave him the things to write in the Genesis. 
It had the hinges in your life. There's things happening in the past, and there's things that's going to happen in the future. How do you know those things are going to come true? Because Jesus Christ, what? Earn it and puts it upon your heart and shows you those things to hold on to, just like he did Abraham. He gave those things to Abraham to write down for us to study by. And it's exactly how it is in your life. He tells you the things go out here and tell people that are lost. He tells you to go out here and tell people at Walmart that you should make see. And even more important than that, sometimes you have to tell your brothers and sisters in Christ what is ahead because we get down on ourselves sometimes. Because Christ is there. He's never failed any of us. Never has, never will, never can. But we get down on ourselves and we get down on each other. And sometimes we need to be picked up through by the Spirit. Say, Lord, oh, woe is me. And we need a brother or sister to come by and say, Christ still loves you. So get up. And you know what? Sometimes we're down there wallowing in the mud and the mire and the clay and it hurts. But Christ says, get up. It's hard sometimes. He said, get up and stand and stand boldly on what? On Jesus Christ. Stand on me and I will be there. Because whatever Muslims are on the mountain, right? He said he wanted to see what? Wanted to see God. And the Lord said, you can't look upon him. No man's looked upon the Lord and live. So he puts him on a rock. And what is the rock? It's Jesus Christ. He puts him in that rock. We can see Christ. We can see the Lord. We can see God through him by Jesus Christ, right? And see, he said, whenever I come by, he said, I'm going to put you in a cliff of a rock. And we better make sure that whenever our hearts are there, we better be in the same cliff that Moses was in. Because we're not in the cliff of the rock of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're not making it into the gates of glory. And as he comes by, what does he do? He covers with what? He covers Moses' face up with his hand. The same hand that wrote the Ten Commandments, he gives them to him. There, or, and he's there, and he writes it down with the tip of his face. He writes those things down. And Moses brings Christ off, and he's preaching and teaching Jesus. Jesus Christ, he's preaching of a future that we need to be ready for. And we think, and what? He was in the beginning, he was now, and he's what? Here to come. And we need to know that in our hearts. How do you know that? Because I was bought and saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is exactly how. Because the boys of the Old Testament, the boys of the New Testament, and the ladies too were led by what? Led by the Spirit. Because they wrote this stuff down for us to understand that things had happened before and things happened. They see these things that's going to happen in the future if the Lord wasn't taking and showing those things to us. Wasn't revealing it through them by the Spirit. They can't do it. Theologians and stuff try to preach and teach and they try to tell you this is going to happen and that's going to happen. If it's contrary to the Word of God, it ain't going to happen. Everything that the Word of God says is true. Jesus Christ is true. And whenever he was there in front of Pilate, right, Pilate tried to wash his hands up, but he couldn't because he's still guilty. He's guilty of one sin. He's guilty of all of them. And that's what it is. I may not commit adultery, but I may steal or I may do this. He said, if you violate one commandment, you're guilty of all. And though that means what? There's no little sin and there's no big sin. Sin is sin in God's eyes. And we don't have a way out except for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And God is there, right? And the two angels come. And he takes him into the house. And they're trying to get him to come out. They're trying to get him to come out. What? And come back out into the world. And they what? They're there. And Lot says, here, I have two dollars. Take my two dollars. Take my two churches. Take my two dollars out here and do with them what you want to. And you know what? That's how it is in the world sometimes. We'll give a church up. Let our loved one go out. So what did David do? Whenever David was there and he uh, was talking, you know, and they would say, well, he's just a ruddy kid, whatever he was born. And Saul was there and he was looking at him. And all of Jesse's uh, sons had come by, but not David yet. And what did the Lord say? And, uh, and he, he tells him, the Lord tells him, said, don't look upon his stature. He said, the Lord does not look at his outside. Does not look at his physical appearance. The Lord looks at his what? At his heart. He told that in the New in the Old Testament. So as the Lord is looking up on his heart, he knew that David's heart was where it needed to be because David had been called. And you know what about it, Christian? You have been called also to fight the battle of Jesus Christ, to let people see that there is something better in this world. It looks like sometimes we're going to lose, but Christ has never lost the battle, never has and never will. And so if I'm in Christ's hands, I'm not going to lose that. I may die out one day and go what? Go into the dirt grave, but thank God that through by the resurrection of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Whenever what death finds me, so shall the judgment. And it's going to be a just judgment. It's going to be true and it's going to be just. But I'm going to be able to stand with Christ on that day. And I better be able to stand with Christ today, knowing that I better be able to what? Put on that armor that David took off of Saul's, right? He got rid of it because it wasn't proven. But the armor that Christ gives us has been proven from the beginning of time. Amen. 
It's settled, and it will always be true. There's no catch in his armor. If we're rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ, we will survive this thing. It looks like the Lord is going to lose. He's not. It looks like the world is going to take over this thing. He is not. Jesus Christ is king forevermore, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's going to come back. And the Bible tells us, we look at him, he's coming back and he's pulling out a sword. But in Revelation, he tells us, he said, I'm going to fight this battle with the sword, but it's the sword of his mouth. It's the word. Whenever Christ was walking with us on the land, right? He was here whenever he was born. He was 33 years old. He preached like, for what, three and a half years. So he was walking and he was preaching and teaching and stuff. Even from the beginning, when he was a babe, they was looking out for this man, Jesus Christ. They was wanting to get rid of him. He's laying in a manger and hearing him, wanting to go destroy him. So the wise men, they're there, right? And they go to see this Christ child. Simeon was there and he picked him up because he knew that there was something special. He said, I saw the salvation of the Lord and now he can die because what? We can die too because we have seen what? The salvation of the Lord. And his name is Jesus Christ. He was laying in that, in that little, little manger, right? There's no room for him in the end. There's no room for him in the world. But there's room for him in our hearts. And it's the only place that he dwells. He dwells in our hearts. This is the temple of God. It ain't the building. We need to reverence the building, of course. We know that. But this building does not house Jesus Christ. This building right here houses Jesus Christ. Because we need to make it what? Make sure that our temple is clean. How do we clean the temple? We pray and have fasting. Not fasting of food and water and bread and stuff like that. Fasting of the word of the Lord. Sit down and study and suffer what the Lord's got in store for us. But as Lot is there, right? Lot is there. And the angels, they, they're there. And Lot said, take my two daughters. But what did they do? The angels are there. They pull a lot back in. They're pressing against them. And the, the people that are outside the door said, we're going to deal with you. You're judging us. And that's exactly right. Because they were lost. They were the world. And Lot's telling them, no, just take these. And don't do that because the church is pure. The pure church. Now I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But you can look in here and you say, well, I don't want to go down there to that church down there. There's a bunch of hypocrites. And old feller said, I'd rather, rather live with a bunch of hypocrites than die with them, right? And that's exactly right. I'd rather stay in a church and try to take and walk. We look on Jesus Christ than to go out here and die in the world. I'd rather stand up for Jesus Christ and draw, try to draw people in than to go out here and die in the world. Because if I die in the world, I'm going to a devil's hell. And those angels were there with Lot, right? They were there. And what Lot was outside. And if you look at it, they reach out and they bring Lot into the house, right? They bring him back in. And that's how it is. You know, whenever David was there, and as I said, he goes out and they was looking at him. And when two, uh, two lambs had got dragged off, one by a lion and one by a bear. And what does David do? David goes out and he goes out and he fights with them. And he takes them. what? He takes the lambs out, and, out of the bear and the lion's mouth and kills the lion and the bear. And he saves the lamb. And that's what we might be doing as a Christian. Because our loved ones are small Christian. It might be whatever it is. It may be older Christian or young Christian. They'll come in and get saved. And they say, Lord, take care of us. They need guidance. Not only young Christian, but older Christian need guidance too. Because we get weak sometimes. We get weak and old weary. Oh, Lord, how long is it going to last? It'll last until the Lord says it's over. And we need to be prepared as a thief in the night comes on your door. We need to be prepared. We don't know that hour. But the Lord knows. But if we're prepared, we're not unprepared, right? We're not unaware. Because he said you're aware and you know that whenever it comes back, that you're prepared and your feet are rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ on the rock. Not a rock, but the solid rock, which is Jesus Christ. And David brought those lambs back in. And as a Christian, that's what we need to do. When our loved ones and our, and our Christians are out in the world, they turn their back on Jesus Christ. We need to be like David. I fail too. We need to go out and tell them, you need to come back into the church. Not the church, but the church of Jesus Christ. You need to get back in and come back in to Jesus Christ. Because the world has nothing to offer you. It will for a while, and it is. It's pretty. There's things out there in the world for a while, and they're all right, and we have a good time. There's fun for sin and what? For a season. And then it's over. And then sudden what? Death and destruction. And if death and destruction finds us in the world, it's over with. We're dead. So those angels grab Lot, what? And they bring him back into the house. They bring him back into the church. They bring him back in. But what did they do at that point? They shut the door, right? The door is shut. The angels shut the door so the outside world can't get back into the church. There was another door that was shut one time, right? It was called an ark. 
We look at it being a boat. We need to look at it being Jesus Christ. He is the ark in the covenant. So the ark was there, right? And it was floating upon the seas and stuff. We look at it and float down the river. Look at it as being Jesus Christ. And the world is there. Noah was there with his family and stuff. And the world tries to confound it. And they're trying to drag it out. They was also, whenever Peter was in the boat, right? They saw a spirit. And they told him, said, what? Lord, Lord, and, and so, Lord if that's you. And they, he told him, said, don't be afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come. And what does the Lord tell him? Come. And is it not telling us the same thing? He's telling us, come. Come on in me. I will give you rest. My burden is light. Follow me, and I will deliver you from this depths of hell. I will let you sit with me in my kingdom and on my throne where I'm sitting with the Father, making intercession for you. You can come into heaven and dwell with me, and I will dwell with you. I will be your Savior if you will allow me to. I will deliver you from your ungodliness. I will deliver you just like that old dog that runs back to its own vomit. He's not running back to somebody else's vomit. He runs back to his own vomit. Just like that was in the world. I'll run back to the things that I left behind me. I will run back to those things that I left and got away from, which Jesus Christ, I didn't leave him. He took those things from me. Because I couldn't give those things up on my, on my own or on my, uh, by myself. I needed help to do that. Because Christ delivered me from myself in this present and dying world. And his lot is there, right? He's brought back into the house. And the angels are there. And what do they do? They put a what? A blinding. They blind them. A blinding light. Now what are they telling them? What are they giving them? We think about shining a spotlight in their eyes? No. They're there giving them Jesus Christ. They can't see. They were so blind they couldn't even find the door. And ain't that how it is sometimes? We see people that's wandering around and we say that. No, they're so blind they can't even find the door. Not physical, but spiritual blindness. And the door, I was the same way. I was there for a long time, for 30-some years, and I was wandering around, and I could not find the door because I was blind. But all of a sudden, I found the door, and that door is Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing that I've done, nothing I could do, nothing I've ever done except accept my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in my life. That's the best thing in my life that it ever can happen. If I hold on to him, he said, I'll give all these things unto you. I'll give all those things to you. I'll give you life. You may have to suffer now. I may have to work for $50 a day right now or whatever. But if I'm working for 50 and 10 years down the road, I'm looking for a million, ain't it worth working for 5 or $10 today and know that whenever I die and I go to heaven, everything is given unto me? Yes, it is. Because I might work for a little bit now, and those things are going to give to us. Yes, I have the spirit the, uh, uh, of Jesus Christ in our life. We have a little bit of rejoicing sometimes whenever we come together with our brothers and sisters, and we can see the thing that the Lord does. We can see that friends and family are getting saved sometimes. We see those things that people got baptized. Had one get baptized last Sunday down there at the creek down there at Turner Shimlake. Thank God he got saved and gave his life to the Lord before he died. And hopefully he holds on. So if somebody sees him out, they need to give him an uplifting and show him. So those two angels are there, right? And they bring old Lot back in and they shut the door. Just like on the ark, whenever Noah and his family was there, the ark, the door was shut. And who shut it? God. The mercy door was shut. There was no way in. And that's how it was right here. There was no way into the house. They couldn't even find the door. Because they were blinded by light. They could not get in. But the two angels had brought what? Brought what? Back into the church. Brought him back in. And the Lord shut the door. And they tell him. Tell Lot. Say, go out. Don't you have brothers? Don't you have sons? And son-in-laws and daughters and your wife? Go tell them. And he tells his son-in-laws. Now look at it as being church leaders instead of Church, that's the church of the leaders, right? It's representation of the men of the church. He's telling them, hey, this church, you got to get into Christ. You got to turn. And his son and his son in law. But what did they do? They did not turn. They wanted to be in the world, right? The Bible tells us they didn't turn. The only ones that were led out of Sodom and Gomorrah were who? Lot, his wife, and their two daughters. All right, so if we're looking at that, Lot is there and his two wives and his daughters. They're being laid out. But Lot, 
doesn't want to go yet. And they're telling him, say, go out to the valley. Go up onto the mountain and dwell there and get out of the city because if you don't, you're going to be destroyed. And as Christ is there, we say, well, Lord, wasn't that? Christ was there. It was Jesus Christ that was telling them. Get out of the city. And Christian, if we're here, we need to get out of the city and get back in Jesus Christ. Lost person, if you're here, you need to get out of the city and get into Jesus Christ. Because he's the only way out. On top of the mountain, he's the only way. So the angels finally just grab and tell, and tell him. Say, come on. Because he's stalling out. Sometimes we need a good kick in the butt to get us going, don't we? I mean, we do. Oh, Lord's man. And the Lord says, get up and move. Because what? He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. We think about being, being Christ, and it is. Absolutely. But you know what? My inner man has to be stronger than my outer man. Because he thought my outer man is stronger than my inner man, my outer man will destroy my inner man. But through and by Jesus Christ, my inner man, my spiritual man, can what? Overwhelm the outside. Only through and by the help of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I can win out. So they go out, right? They're led. They're laying out and they're going out. He's leading the churches. He's leading them out. And then all of a sudden, what happens? One of them. The wife, which is a representation of the church, right? It is. Looks back, doesn't she? She wants to look just like that old hound dog and goes back to his, his own vomit. And all of a sudden, what happens? She turns into a pillow of salt. She's dead. As a church, she is dead. And Christian, if you're here and you belong to Davis Chapel Church, if your name is on a, on a roll book here, he can be on a roll book from here to, to, to kingdom come. It doesn't mean you're saved. You have to be bought by the blood. Your name has to be written in this right here, the Lamb's Book of Life. And if it isn't, you're not saved. doesn't matter what anybody tells you. It's only through by Jesus Christ. He said, if I write your name in, nobody can take it out. But when you look at it also, that prodigal son turned and got away from the Father, right? So we need to be about our Father's business. Knowing that, if Jesus Christ is out making intercession with the Father, the Bible tells us that he knew me before I was ever conceived. He was hanging on the cross. And he said, Father, hold this, not hold this charge not to them. Because they don't know what they do. Do we think that he's just thinking about those people that were there? No, he was talking about the whole world. Hold it not to them, Father, because they don't know what they're doing. But I can lead them. I can direct them in a path of righteousness. And I can get the glory. If I get the glory, Father, you know you get the glory because we're one. The Father and the Son are one. The Spirit is one. And all three of them are combined. So we give the Father the glory, the Son the glory, and the Spirit the glory. Knowing that, we can stand on Jesus Christ. But if He touches your heart and your hair stands up on your head and you get chill amongst the Holy Spirit runs all over you, you know that it's right because Christ is for alive forevermore. Always has been and always will be. Nothing has changed from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. Nothing has changed. Never has, never will. Knowing that, Christian, whenever you got saved, nothing has changed. He saved you, right? So stand on Christ. He didn't tell you to go out here and, and quit. He didn't tell me to go out here and quit. He told me to stand firmly and be what? Be bold. Be bold. Stand on Christ. And Lot is there, and he goes out, and his daughters and uh, and uh, uh, him are there in the church. Well, Lot's wife, his representation of the church, she what? She turns away from it. And if you look in the world today, you look at there's a lot of church leaders that are leading churches astray. They want to preach all this ungodliness. There's other ways they want people to come in and, and flamboyant and, and pretty things and rhinestones upon their suits or whatever it is. It's all glitz and glamour, all vanity. But the word of God is not. It's true and settled in heaven. Always has been. Always will be. And we think about the word. We think about the written word here. But what is the word of God that's true and settled in heaven? It's Jesus. That's where we must be saved. That's the law that is there. Well, we're not under the law. Yes, if we violate one, we violate it all. 
That's what he says. Not that we're under the law, but through my grace, we have accomplished that because the law condemns us. The law shows us that what that we're sinners, and it brings what? The law of the Bible tells us that the law brings death. But through my Jesus Christ, I have grace, and I have life more of what? More abundantly. Through my Jesus Christ. In him only, whereby I must be saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And you can't wash your hands from it. Pilate tried, right? Had the base of the water. I was washing my hands from it. The rich man was in, in the depths of hell. He wanted water too, right? But he wanted a different water. He didn't want this. He wanted the water that flows from the throne of God. And there was a gulf from there that he couldn't come up. There's a gulf from Christ, the Lord, that he couldn't go down. And that gulf is what? The blood of Christ. You can't cross it. You cannot cross it. Because things that are in the depths of hell are not coming up to be with Christ. And the things that are in heaven with Jesus Christ, they're not going down. Because it's all spiritual. We think about this physical body. You know, the physical body, once death finds you, so shall the judgment. We think about any, and Moses being there, and we preach and teach, some people preach and teach, say, well, that's the two witnesses over in Revelation that's going to come back and take up a body and be trodden down. We better study the cyber. The two bodies that are being trained down to two witnesses is what? The Spirit and the Word. Because if you look at it right now, are they not being trodden down underfoot? People are walking over the Word of God, Jesus Christ, they're putting Him under their foot, and what? The Spirit, they're overriding the Spirit. They just say, it can't save me. And that's blaspheming the Holy Ghost. That's the only sin that we will not be forgiven of is denying the power of God to save me. Denying the power when Christ touches my heart to tell me, Tim, you need a Savior. And I deny it. I don't get saved. Then I'm going to the devil's hell. All the other things in the world I can do. I can even hang Christ on the cross. I could have been there and spit upon him. Because there was a thief that was there, right? That thief was there. In the 11th hour and the 50 minute, he had 10 minutes or whatever how long it was. He was right there at the end. And he called out unto who? Jesus Christ. Hanging on a cross. He was hanging there in agony, but he still had enough compassion and love and mercy to save a guy that was beside him. He had called a legion of angels and brought him down. We think about it. Hey, why don't we? Christ is God. He just step off. They had no power over him. He tells Pilate, Pilate said, I can I can do, kill you. I can do this and do that. He said, You have no power over me. None except what the Father allows you to have. What the Father allows you to have. And they had no power over God. None. Because God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all one. They had no power. But thank God that whenever he delivered that what? That thief that was hanging on the cross in that very minute, right before he was getting ready to die probably, the Lord what? Forgive him. He said, Father, hold not this charge to them because they know what they do. And that's how it is in my life, right? Sitting there beside the Father and saying, Lord, don't hold this to him because he knows not what he does. But once I get saved, I know what I do, right? I'm not a foolish child. The Bible tells us uh, a, poor, a poor wise child is, is what uh, more knowledge than a, a, a foolish king. And as we look at it and say, well, a king, no, he, he's talking about a Christian. A poor Christian that is getting saved, we're not talking about money wise, we're talking about somebody just getting saved. Understands the word of God, and we have more riches than the richest king. Because our Father give it all to us through by the Son, Jesus Christ. Y'all pray for me and my family. I, I can't do can't do altar calls or anything. I, you know, ain't no good. Dad ain't no good preacher or anything else. Just try. Uh, Y'all stand just for a minute. Anybody got anything on their heart?